Con men, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool, and calculating. They betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes, and to uncover how they were brought dramatically to justice. In this show, the incredible tale of one of Britain's most prolific and compulsive con men, whose criminal career spans more than a quarter of a century and who has adopted at least 24 known aliases. His cons not only rob people of their money, but they also put people's lives in grave danger. Paul Bint is a traveling serial con man. He is a 41-year-old man who has been appearing before the courts from the age of 16. He's a man who lives in a fantasy world. The sort of people that Paul Bint impersonated were all figures of authority, very clever people, who, professional people who were looked up to and admired. That's obviously something he felt he couldn't have in his normal life and he needed it and craved it. I've never, ever come across a con man like Paul Bint. He is very much a one-off. Paul Bint has committed more than 100 offences and audaciously posed as doctors in hospitals, an aristocrat, a playboy, a property magnet, and even masqueraded as Orlando Pownall QC, the barrister who worked on the infamous Jill Dando murder trial in the UK. Such a relentless confidence trickster, the British press has crowned him King Con. He's so deeply involved in playing these characters and the, the temporary status and success that he achieves through them that he can't kind of give them up. I guess he's kind of addicted to them. The thing that I guess makes him unusual and that various forensic and criminal psychiatrists have concluded is that he doesn't, there's no salvation in this story. He doesn't really seem to be coming to his senses at all. And hospitals, it would seem, are the backdrop of, for his fantasy world. A hospital to him would be like Disney World to a six-year-old. And it was in hospitals that Paul Bint's first known con began. Incredibly, this man, with no medical or surgical training whatsoever, walked into a hospital in Kettering, North Ants, England, in 1983, posing as a locum doctor. Paul Bint stole a white coat and stethoscope, and set to work, plundering from the sick and the dying and stealing from his so-called colleagues. A year later, Paul Bint was pulling exactly the same disturbing con in the capital at the Whittington Hospital, North London, England. On the A&E ward of the Royal Whittington Hospital, Bint assumed the identity of Dr. Dominic York. Bint had discovered that Dr. York had gone to work in the USA and so simply claimed he had returned to the UK sooner than expected. The man who coolly strolled into Whittington, using it as his hunting ground, cruelly took his con even further. When wearing his white coat, he perilously set to work as a doctor on the wards. While at the North London Hospital, despite no training, Paul Bint relished and performed a variety of tasks. He arranged x-rays, attended to a patient with a collapsed lung, and administered 12 stitches to a man with a head injury. He'd managed to sneak his way into various hospitals, mostly in London, it seemed, during that period. Steal a doctor's coat, um, often steal a stethoscope or other equipment or a pager. Well, as soon as he put on the white coat, he was instantly, if you like, short-circuiting people's doubt and mistrust reaction. They were automatically inclined to trust him because they thought he was a doctor. So they're therefore going to put a lot more weight in things that he says. Now, how he was able to carry it on from there, I think it speaks a lot to his conman characteristics. He's obviously able to improvise and to talk a good game. He's able to sound convincing. Classic characteristics of a conman. When talking about infiltrating the Royal Whittington Hospital in London, England, Paul Bint dubiously claims he studied medical books for six months, went through an interview process, and won the position of over 23 qualified doctors. When I put to him that he was playing God with people's lives, that he was putting lives at risk, he said that 
No, he'd studied the medical books. If there was something he wasn't sure of, he'd always refer it. Um, and he claimed that he acted responsibly. I mean, that, again, just shows you the level of self-deception that's going on with such an individual. The reality was he was an unremarkable man who had strolled in off the street and terrifyingly consulted with patients and administered treatments to seriously ill people. From the Whittington Hospital, Bint did shifts at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in East London and the Hammersmith Hospital. At these British hospitals, his disturbing, dangerous and reckless behaviour continued. It's fairly well documented that he did do a number of very alarming things, such as putting stitches in a man who came into accident emergency with a head wound, and he changed the drip on somebody, I think, come round after surgery. There was even a claim that he was present during emergency heart surgery in, in one uh, hospital in London. So he, he was involved in some very serious medical situations. He was putting lives potentially at risk by doing that, and he was manipulating them at a time when they were at their most vulnerable. By arrogantly assuming the role of doctor, Paul Bint had found the perfect con and playground to support an extravagant lifestyle and to also fulfil his own warped fantasies of self-importance and grandeur. By putting on a doctor's coat, you're taking advantage of what you might call the authority effect or the white coat effect, because doctors are a class of society who automatically command a lot of trust. And, and that's something that con men often do. They often pose as an authority figure. And of course, people would respond to him very differently as Dr. Bint than Mr. Bint. So he would gain respect, he would uh, have the trust of other people, which of course would allow him to exploit them. I think Paul Bint obviously became a little bit of a Walter Mitty type character. He believed he was a doctor, he believed he had power over these patients and that he was giving them care and attention in the way that a doctor would. A good question is whether or not he realised that he was endangering people's health, or maybe even their lives, let alone their emotional state. And again, you have to ask whether... He may, he may have realised it, I don't know, but he probably didn't care, even if he did realise it, because he just... He probably didn't have the same emotional processes that normal people have, so he, he didn't have a conscience in the same way that you and I would. And this was just the beginning of a notorious and compulsive conman career. No one could predict the audacity and extremes Paul Bint would go to, his crimes only limited by his own imagination and fantasies. When off duty from his surgical scam, nightclubs were Bint's prowling ground of choice. He would use his false identities to seduce women. But he wouldn't just steal their hearts, he would steal their cash. I mean, it's anything from him claiming to have slept with a thousand women and countless aliases, I think, from kind of aristocrats to kind of double barreled barristers. And even one of his defence counsels actually said he makes Walter Mitty look like a nine o'clock newsreader. Paul Bint is a serial conman whose career has spanned three decades of shocking and unsettling scams. In the early 1980s, he infiltrated hospitals posing as a doctor and dangerously administered treatments to unsuspecting patients waiting for the care and attention from professional medical staff. He often justified it by saying he was there on the front line, he probably saved a few lives, he pored over medical books, he'd done his research, he was responsible. If there was something he didn't know, he described it as a kind of sequential process being in an accident emergency, you would pass on. A particular problem. It's easy to get sidetracked by the fact that he'd taken on this persona of a doctor and was in the environment of hospitals. He was just a con man in, in the basic sense of the term, using that environment in order to get money from people. But it wasn't just wish fulfillment and money on Paul Bint's mind. He used his fake status to practice his bedside manner outside the hospital. When not putting patients' lives at risk with his scandalous surgical scam, he compulsively scoured nightclubs in search of women. Bint claims to have slept with a thousand women, he would take them to bed and then take their money. Paul Bint reportedly attempted to seduce women in nightclubs with the immortal line, trust me, I'm a doctor. Supposedly one of his girlfriends said that was one of his pickup lines. Where they're in a nightclub, he supposedly was fondling her breast and says, OK, trust me, I'm a doctor. 
The reality of it is that Paul Bint would have been treated quite differently by females if they believed that he had the power and status that go with being a doctor. But crucially, he would have had more confidence when he was playing out those roles. So he wouldn't be able to impress women maybe on a normal day-to-day -day basis as himself, but as Dr. Bint or Barrister Bint, then of course he's gonna have more charm, more confidence, and he's gonna be more able to woo the ladies. In all of my cases, women featured. Um, it, it, it's part of, of um, his game, yes. It's kind of interesting that he seems to have managed to con women of a certain age and education, often career women who are very, very successful in, in their lives, enjoying their good careers and doing very well. And perhaps they kind of buy in just a little bit too much to the idea of who he is. Some of the women that I spoke to said that he can be a very kind of caring lover. And uh, because he'd managed to, I guess, ob obtain a certain amount of money through other criminal work, he would often spend quite a lot of money on these women. It would always be with the idea that he was going to con them out of a much greater sum of money at the end. Whilst serially conning women, Paul Bint could not keep away from hospitals. But his first run of success as a con man could not last forever. In 1983 and 1984, when Bint was posing as an A&E doctor, his life-threatening lies caught up with him, and he was arrested. In the 80s, he received a couple of sentences. The first one was about 18 months of stealing doctors' coats and equipment and posing as a doctor. It's been claimed on many occasions by various defence counsels that he's suffering from some kind of mental illness or psychosis. In 84, and the judge didn't accept it for one minute because you could see that he'd been operating in a very irresponsible and potentially life-threatening way and gave him a very stiff sentence of five years. Not that, of course, he learned anything from it. After being released from prison, Paul Bint quickly returned to his Walter Mitty ways, but this time he adopted a brand new tack. He decided that the best way to con his way to richness, status and into women's bedrooms was to adopt the personas of a string of wealthy, eminent and successful individuals. He stole the tools necessary to create the illusion of wealth and status. Although no one can tell if he stole to convince people he was successful and wealthy, or if he convinced people he was successful and powerful in order to help him steal. He seemed to need both equally. He claimed to be the Duke of Arundel and invented the persona of a wealthy aristocrat called Piers Oppenheimer in order to successfully scam and seduce, but the police were always on his tail. They arrested him several times, and in 1988 he found himself back behind bars serving a four-year sentence. If he believes he is Piers Oppenheimer or he is, you know, a double-barreled surnamed uh, leading barrister, that's enough for him, and for, he'll ride it for as long as he can. So um, I think you probably need to have, on a deeper psychological level, you need to have extremely low self-esteem, uh, and you need to have a commitment to see it through, even though you know it's going to catch, catch up with you eventually. The sort of people that Paul Bint sort of impersonated or took on personas of were all figures of authority, very clever people, who professional people who were looked up to and admired. That's obviously something he felt he couldn't have in his normal life and he needed it and craved it. In 1993, released from prison, Paul Bint reverted to his old hunting ground of hospitals. Once again, he would put seriously ill patients' lives at risk by posing as a doctor in a bid to feed his ego and his wallet. In 1993, he infiltrated St. James's Hospital in Leeds, England, before breaching security at the nearby York District Hospital, where the cold-hearted con reached new heights in terms of its cruelty towards Bint's victims. He told the parents of a 17-year-old girl who'd just been involved in, a, in an accident that... Um, that their daughter would live, and six hours later she died. Now, you could say that's emotionally reckless. I mean, again, you wouldn't expect a con man to have any consideration of their actions. I mean, he was kind of cold and calculating in that, in that process. So there's that kind of emotional cruelty, but there's clearly the very serious matter of him being in a position where potentially someone could have died because he could have made the wrong diagnosis or, or performed the wrong um, emergency operation. I mean, to tell the parents of a child that they're going to live only to find out a short while later that that's just not true is, is treating people's emotions with such disdain. It's horrible. After causing this devastation and heartache, 
Corbin was briefly held at a psychiatric hospital in Yorkshire, but once released in 1993, he headed to Lancashire, England, and walked into the Royal Preston Hospital, ready to continue his compulsive surgical scam. In Preston General Hospital, he's offered to act as an anaesthetist with one case. So again, very serious, life-threatening um, decisions that he was making. In the instance when I dealt with him at Royal Preston Hospital, which was actually on Boxing Day of 1993, he'd gone to Royal Preston Hospital and claimed he was a locum covering for the surgical registrar. He knows the layout of hospitals. He went to the uh, telephonist room. He obtained the surgical registrar's pager and had all his calls diverted to, to himself. One of the great dangers with this was that the surgical registrar was on a major incident team, so if over that Christmas New Year period there'd been a major incident, obviously he wouldn't have been able to be contacted because Paul Bint had the pager. When Paul Bint was playing the role of Dr Bint, he would have been very deeply immersed in his fantasy life. And so actually the people who he was applying treatment to, to him would just be like extras in a TV production. And they would just be tools for him really to act out his fantasies. He probably didn't see them as real people at all. I believe that his basic motive for entering hospitals was to steal he would go in knowing that there were good pickings if he could get into the consultant surgeon's changing rooms near to the operating theatres and then would steal wallets containing credit cards and then he would use those credit cards to obtain money to live off for some time. I view Paul Bint as a compensatory narcissist. So what that means is that the reality of himself is so inadequate that he wants to escape from that. So he retreats into a fantasy world. He'll be preoccupied with fantasies of himself as brilliant, as successful, as confident and everything that he would wish to be. But it's also got to be about control and about power and potentially also always leads you to the women. By posing as a doctor, he often would meet people in that environment that he would then form relationships with. A woman he was seeing in Preston, England, began to see through his white coat and stethoscope. He spoke so often about his, his work at Royal Preston, his work as a doctor. It was basically his sole topic of conversation. And if they were out socially, he continually referred to the fact he was a doctor because he was in her company for a few weeks. She eventually thought that this just cannot be genuine. She was an intelligent girl and, and her mother as well began to feel that there was something not right about Paul Bint. The woman contacted the police and the truth unfolded. But even in custody, Paul Bint's lies kept coming. On arrest, he'd given false details. He'd indicated he was Dr David Watkin, who whose details he'd obtained from a wallet he'd stolen from Leicester Royal in Infirmary. He went through an interview claiming to be this person and then we indicated near the end of the interview that we knew who he was from his fingerprint records, that we knew he was Paul Bint and we, we knew his past record. He then wanted to be my best friend because he wanted bail, he wanted to get out again, and there was no realistic hope of him getting bail because it was obvious that he'd re-offend and he'd abscond. Paul Bint was refused bail and when he faced trial in October 1994, was once again sent to prison, this time for five years. However, Michael Tomenay put into action a plan that was intended to prevent Paul Bint ever repeating his hospital scam in the future. On his release in 1996, I arranged through the health service to have an early warning system when Paul was released from prison. I informed all the hospitals nationally and uh, we did a, a circulation to all police forces uh, informing people that he was out and about. And I understand that that system still continues to this day. But why does Paul Bint continue to revert to his surgical scam? 
When exploring his past, there are clues to help uncover and understand why Bint fixates upon and relentlessly targets hospitals in his cons. His reason was that he says that he, when he was the age of 12, he went into hospital to have an appendix operation. He says because of his parents splitting up and because of a difficult family background, he says it was the first time that he'd experienced unconditional care and love and a kind of safe environment. I think that is the point where the obsession started and he seems to have made no secret of that by saying the incident of him having his appendix out, that was clearly a catalyst for his behaviour in the future. It is possible that when Paul went to hospital and had his appendix out, that the treatment he received from hospital staff was the best treatment that he'd actually had as a child so far. So that's very sad, and that tells you where the roots of his fantasy life started. But of course that's not a whole explanation for his behaviour. His behaviour is complex and it's bizarre. And it's probably wrong to try and explain a whole lifetime of pathological behaviour with one incident like that. But it does give us a clue, I think, as to his motivations, which is that he obviously associated being a doctor and being in that medical environment with a lot of things that were positive attributions for him. So he obviously felt kind of happy and, and safe and cared for in the hospital environment. And then later on, by posing as doctor, he could presumably get all those things you get when you put on a white coat, respect, admiration, people listening to you, people paying attention to you. So you can see how that would drive him. For reasons of uh, escape and control, I think from a very early age, he pretended to be other people and found that that was a way of wiping those kind of problems clean. And so by claiming that he was actually helping people, he's trying to justify his own actions um, in a pretty feeble way, but you know, his psychology in that sense is pretty feeble, so he's able to convince himself. I mean, one of his former girlfriends said to me that uh, the thing about Paul Bint is that he's never come to terms with his own ordinariness. By 1996, Paul Bint was once again out of prison and his compulsion to live out his conman fantasies was stronger than ever. This time, the serial confidence trickster had a new destination and target in mind. He was heading north to Scotland. And I looked out and he was gone and the car was gone. Because I thought, that's a bit odd, because I still had the car keys. Since the early 80s, Paul Bint has spent time in and out of prison. Over 25 years, he has made a career of adopting aliases to dupe the public on an eclectic and extraordinary collection of levels. But his primary focus has always been infiltrating hospitals and posing as doctors, administering dangerous, life-threatening treatments and stealing from the staff and patients. By putting on that identity, maybe in his own twisted psychology, he was somehow short-cutting straight to all those attributes that he valued so much, you know, respect, status, without actually having to work for it. After serving time for the northwest of England surgical scam, it wasn't long before Paul Bint once again set to work conning, and his legacy of cons are not always of the medical variety. By 2000, Paul Bint was in court after tricking rail chiefs into putting him up in a luxury hotel in Edinburgh, Scotland, after posing as Lachlan Campbell Briarden, the QC involved in the Lockerbie bombing trial. And this would not be the last time he would pose as an esteemed lawyer. However, upon release, Paul Bint returned to Scotland and the cons continued. In 2001, he was passing himself off as a millionaire property magnate. Bint, under another alias, made an appointment at a luxury car dealership and appeared to be in the market to acquire a sporty number. He introduced himself as Paul Blenheim. He says he was a property agent or a property dealer. He was actually in Glasgow that day looking at a nightclub in the city centre that was for sale and he'd actually seen the cars advertised here, so he'd made a phone call to us. He was masquerading as a, as a wealthy millionaire, not a, a famous named person, but somebody with a great deal of money. And he had the air to carry it off uh, and indeed the expensive clothes. Well, he was very well dressed and his, his mannerism was like, well-educated, well-spoken, sort of English-spoken, just like an educated 
businessman. His MO, his modus operandi, is to, is to first of all look the part. So he'd have on his £3,000 Versace suit, which obviously turns out to be a jumble sale suit. He'd, you know, carry a copy of the FT. He'd have a state-of-the-art mobile phone and organiser and Blackberry or whatever. He said that he was... Um, you shouldn't really laugh, I guess, although there is a kind of comical side to it. Um, he, he said he owned uh, a hotel in Mauritius, I think, um, a nightclub in London. He had property in Edinburgh and London. Um, and on the face of it, I guess he looked like a kind of cast-iron prospect. You imagine the kind of pound signs registering in the salesman's eyes. He says he was in the market for a very expensive sports car, so he looked at a few and he asked if we could take a test drive in the Ferrari. He would drop into the conversation various information that he gathered about the cars, because, I mean, it's true that he has driven a number of Porsches and Bentleys and, uh, and Aston Martins in the past, so he has actually got some experience of driving, obviously not at all in a legal way, mostly through having stolen them. Common quite often use elements of truth in their lies because uh, it's so much easier to make yourself believe that you're telling the truth if some of what you're saying is actually the truth. So I took on my test drive in the Ferrari. It was maybe just a wee bit too sporty, noisy for him. So he decided to suit his image. He would go for the Aston Martin because it was more, as you would say, a sort of gentleman's sports car. Normally, a customer wants to drive a car to see the like and feel of it. So, because I drove a Ferrari, I just took him out and just let him drive the Aston Martin, and I was in the passenger seat. Then he decided, basically, he was going to buy the car, made a few phone calls, organised with his bank to pick up a bank draft. With everything appearing above board, Ross Campbell and his customer, Mr Blenheim, a.k.a Paul Bint, had time to kill until the banker's draft would be cleared and the sale completed. So we stopped for lunch. So I said, well, this pub here is just open. But when the arm, he parked the car. I took the key and locked the car. Then we went into the pub. Uh, right away, he was using his phone. So I ordered up a couple of drinks and sandwiches. And he says, I'm just going to pop out to use my phone. They thought he popped out for a moment to make a phone call. He, in fact, popped out and stole the car and off he went, filled it up with petrol and didn't even pay for that. The drinks arrived, the sandwiches arrived, so I thought, I'll just see where he is, give him a shout, and I looked out, and he was gone, and the car was gone. Which I thought, that's a bit odd, because I still had the car keys. Conned and carless, it had all been lies. There was no bank draft, and now there was no car. Unbeknownst to Ross Campbell, Bint had surreptitiously pocketed the spare keys to the Aston Martin back at the showroom when he was viewing the car's service history file. He had struck again. All Ross Campbell could do was wait and see if the £55,000 sports car would ever be seen again. The Aston Martin was recovered um, four days later. Um, it had 900 miles on the clock. I think he'd used it uh, to drive around various girlfriends that he was duping at the time and uh, he'd managed to do £15,000 worth of damage. Then when the CID came to interview me, then they basically took a description, showed me photographs, then told me basically this chap is a con man, he's got a lot of convictions, he's one of Britain's most wanted con men. In a developing pattern, the police again caught up with Bint and he found himself back behind bars. But on his release from prison in 2002, Paul Bint lost little time in getting started on his next scam, a scam that shrewdly drew together many of the key elements of his past crimes, creating his most comprehensive con yet. He was released on the 11th of December. He's in London by the 12th of December. Um, and he's certainly a man who, who just cannot stop. People who are compulsive liars are very difficult to treat. Um, psychologists say that, you know, Quite often, it, it, they think they're normal. It's everyone else that's not quite right. And once again, hospitals were on the agenda. Although this time he wasn't masquerading as a doctor, this time he was a patient. Like in 2000, Paul Bint was once again presenting himself as a high-profile British barrister. This time he was claiming to be Orlando Pownall QC. He was impersonating Orlando Pownall, Queen's Counsel, who is an eminent lawyer, 
a name probably well known um, to, to a number of people. He had um, prosecuted the case um, involving the murder of Jill Dando, the defendant Barry George. He was also involved around the time in a high-profile murder case of Danielle Jones, which was up in Chelmsford. Someone like Orlando Pownall, the QC in the Jill Dando murder trial, would have been in the public eye at the time this was going on. He'd been in the papers and Paul Bint would have seen his name and seen him as a character that people were reading about. And that's probably why he picked up on his identity and used it. Released from prison in Scotland just two days earlier, Paul Bint had a new alias and with the new identity came a convincing and inspired backstory to execute his most ambitious scam yet. What he did do was arrive in London with no money, as far as we're aware, and nowhere to stay. And so he did attend local hospitals, three in total. He gave the same story at all three, that he was Orlando Powell QC. He had crashed his Aston Martin. He believed that he had received internal injuries. Um, he was in pain. And um, he then submitted himself to certain hospital tests, although he did indicate he was allergic to iodine, which I understand meant that certain tests couldn't be carried out. Of the tests that were carried out, in his urine was a concerning amount of blood. Um, sufficient for the doctors to want to keep him in for observation for some time. And I have no doubt that that blood was, was put in by him. Um, he had not been in a car accident. He had got off the train. Like many of Bint's audacious cons of the past, this continued to feed his ego and his bizarre fantasy life. Well, he would give a medical history and he just can't resist adding exciting bits and part of the medical history on one of his notes um, or one of his sets of hospital notes that I saw was um, that he indicated that he had some shrapnel um, uh, as a result of being involved or um, being involved in the, the Hyde Park bombings. Simply part of his medical history but, but something of... Uh, nothing's ever straightforward with him at all. Someone who becomes a Walter Mitty-type character actually takes on the persona of that character and almost completely believes themselves to be that person. And this con combined elements of his most notorious scams. He has a love of fast cars, um, none of which ever belong to him legitimately, but um, it's something that certainly he had stolen when he was masquerading as a millionaire up in Scotland. The irony is that he comes down to London uh, and professes to have crashed one uh, and uses that in his scam right from the outset. The fact that he'd actually been arrested for stealing an Aston Martin, using that in the story when he um, pretended to be Orlando Pownall, allowed him to, to create a much more effective and plausible lie because some of it was in fact true, he'd been in an Aston Martin. <laughs> Trappings like the Aston Martin or a smart suit, they are absolutely essential to cons, particularly the type of con that he was trying to pull. And in con parlance, that's called putting on the dog, which is basically where you act the part. And that's based on um, some very important victim psychology. So if you're trying to pretend to be rich, for instance, but you don't look rich, you don't look wealthy, you don't look sophisticated, then the people you're trying to hobnob with will automatically suspect you that, and, and they'll have an instant barrier of mistrust. But that works against them because they think they're protected against the people who are trying to rip them off, for instance, because they think they can spot those people. Um, but they, not, they automatically are more likely to accept people that seem like them, that seem well-to-do, that, that have a convincing air about them. Clearly, it wasn't enough for him just to sort of try and pretend to be these people. He needed those extra trappings, the fast cars and the girlfriends and the nice houses. He needed all that other stuff as well to bolster his feeling of being powerful. There is some continuity between his stories in that he may um, adapt a theme and continue it. Uh, certainly in this case, it was interrupted by some years in prison between the two incidences. Straight out of prison, Paul Bint had found a unique way to cope with the fact he didn't have a bed of his own to sleep in. And that bed ensured he had constant care and attention. 
Well, in the hospital, he's taking a bed away from another patient, but he is being... Uh, he has a roof over his head, a nice warm roof over the Christmas period. He has dinner, bed and breakfast, and he has somebody, some bodies, as far as the nurses and doctors are concerned, who, in effect, cater to his every need. Con artists, a lot of what drives them is they do get a thrill out of proving to themselves somehow that they're cut above the, the common herd and that they're a step ahead and that they're, you know, that they're, that they've put one over on you. Um, and I suspect that Paul Bint probably did get a big thrill out of that. And that's probably part of what motivates him because I think it's part of what motivates a lot of car artists. So it's all about having put one over on someone and proving that you are smarter and faster and better than they are. Settled into University College Hospital London, England, Paul Bint knew his scam had a shelf life. So, from his sick bed, he spotted a female doctor who was to become his next unsuspecting victim. His charm offensive began, and she believed his lies. He was Orlando Pownall, QC. They met and exchanged numbers, so I understand, whilst on hospital premises, but she didn't and wasn't involved in his treatment at all. And contact was made by him um, after he had left the hospital. And, as I understand it, they met up and she, um, he indicated that there was a problem with his accommodation. Um, he said his father lived in Millionaire's Row, and, um, but for some reason he couldn't stay there. And he persuaded her to, to use a room, which is what he did, just used a room in her house for, for a short period of time, but that gave him access to her belongings, her money, uh, and, and such like. And Bint took advantage of her generosity. He took the laptop um, computer, he took checks, he took money, um, both from her purse and indeed by apparently borrowing it and of course never, never returning it, uh, and more than one credit card. Um, all of which were used to buy, in the main, extremely expensive suits. He would fully clothe himself in top designer wear but it wasn't long before she became suspicious. They went to a party and he didn't even have any money on him. He'd have forgotten his wallet. And so he'd asked just to borrow some money from her and it became increasingly apparent over those, and it was a very few days, um, that this was a man who said a lot but did very little. And um, she also caught him um, going through items of hers at home and became increasingly suspicious about that and that resulted in her finally um, asking him to leave on Christmas Eve. It was shortly after she had asked him to leave that the trusting female doctor heard some spine-chilling news, that Orlando Powell QC was actually on holiday in Barbados with his family, and the man she had been sharing her home with was, in fact, an imposter. She immediately called the police. Orlando Pownall, Queen's Council, was not in the country at the time. In fact, he was um, overseas on holiday with his family. So once that was discovered, the police were notified. And the police, within an incredibly short period of time, linked it immediately to being Mr Bint. Once more, the hunt for Paul Bint, King Con, was on. Paul Bint has been working as a con man for over 25 years, adopting many aliases. There is a recurring theme in Bint's con man career. Whether posing as a doctor or a patient, he seems obsessed with hospitals. But are his actions those of an opportunist con man, someone who is clinically ill, or is he suffering from some sort of psychological disorder, such as Munchausen syndrome, whereby the subject tries to get attention by feigning illness? In Bint's case, experts believe his motivations are much more complicated. Part of the psychology of Munchausen syndrome sufferers is that they're really seeking attention and they're willing to go through painful or invasive medical procedures if it means they can be the centre of attention. And you can see the same psychology at work in Bint's case in that he relished the attention. Munchausen syndrome is a label that you could apply to Paul Bint. This is when people contrive symptoms of physical illness so that they can receive care and attention. But also, 
Paul was willing to play the role of doctor, not just the role of patient. So it seems to me that the important thing is access to this environment where he can play out his fantasies. And so I would think that maybe a label that's best applied to him would be narcissist. Narcissists are people who are very preoccupied with fantasies of themselves, as somebody who's special, who has power and importance and status and receives special attention. In 2002, two weeks after being released from prison in Scotland for stealing an Aston Martin, Bint was touring hospitals in London, England. This time as a patient instead of a doctor. He was posing as eminent QC Orlando Powell, claiming he had crashed his fictitious Aston Martin and now had internal injuries. After successfully using the scam to get free bed and board at University College Hospital London, England, Paul Bint conned a female doctor into letting him stay with her. After she discovered he'd been stealing from her, she asked him to leave. She then discovered he was not who he claimed to be and she told the police. Unaware the police were again hunting for him, Paul Bint was once again homeless and pulled his scam again, this time audaciously turning up at Hemel Hempstead Hospital near London by ambulance. Christmas Eve, he's homeless again, and uh, he attends another hospital uh, at Hemel Hempstead. He, as I recall, arrived by ambulance on that particular occasion, so how he did that, I don't know. But once he arrived, it was the same story. Eminent QC. Aston Martin, internal injuries, blood in the urine. Oblivious that the police had been alerted to his crimes and were looking for him, Paul Bint continued to go about his business, using hospitals as his hunting ground. Money went missing from patients. The gentleman in the bed next to him uh, lost some money. So did Mr Bint. Mr Bint lost, I think, three or four times the amount of money, apparently. Mr Bint blamed the staff in the hospital. Um, so money was clearly obtained. And the gentleman in the bed next door, his daughter, um, was uh, taken in by Mr Bint. If someone really targets you and gets to know you very well and uh, manipulates you to a large degree and you are a basically trustful person, it's very difficult not to be conned. Paul Bint was discharged from Hamel Hempstead near London, England, but with nowhere to stay, headed to a third hospital with exactly the same story. When he was released from that hospital, he went to the Whittington Hospital and did the same story again. And he stayed in the Whittington Hospital up until New Year's Eve. Whilst he's there, he, and this is the, one of the not so nice sides of Mr. Bint's character, he steals a credit card from a man who was dying, who is now dead, Mr. Lewis, in the adjoining bed and uses that to wine and dine the female that he met. Um, in the second hospital. He's reasonably good looking, although you, again you look closely he kind of dyes his hair and he's certainly not as young as he claims that he is. But you know if he comes in in the flash suit and he's he's often got a wallet full of money. I think when I was spending time with him in Edinburgh he was carrying around £2,000 worth of cash. So perhaps superficially you can see why it might fool some people, it might look the kind of part and you might believe who he is, and you might think, well, here's an interesting individual with lots of money who can show me a good time. You're also taking advantage of what in psychology is called the halo effect, which is if you come across well because you're good-looking or because you're charming or, or, or personable or whatever, you're more likely to be attributed with characteristics that you don't have, um, such as trustworthiness or intelligence. He preys on certain people, either by flattery or by taking advantage of them, for example, with the woman that he took away for the night um, with a stolen credit card. Her, her father had been admitted to hospital um, after a serious uh, emergency on Christmas Eve, and she clearly was not herself when she met this man who was larger than life. You could look at it that he gets a certain amount of financial, sexual, and kind of status validation from doing it. I mean, by pretending to be um, a leading barrister or a ballet dancer or whoever, he clearly um, enjoys the way people respond to that. Money isn't always the only motive. I think sometimes it's the emotional bolstering to feel important and, uh, and clever and to be admired by others that is often the payback for these lies. 
On the 2nd of January, just over three weeks after his release from prison and a hat-trick of hospitals later, the police once again caught up with Paul Bint by playing on one of his key weaknesses, women. While in hospital, Bint had pursued a woman who had spurned his advances, but she agreed to help the police and arranged a date with the con man. Only their romantic evening would be gate-crashed by the constabulary. As I understand it, it was arranged that um, one of the women who he had been trying to take out, who had refused him, um, in fact contacted him, and she encouraged the future meeting which the police attended when he was arrested. Paul Bint as a con man is actually not that effective. He's been caught almost every time he's done anything to try and get money or property. What he's successfully achieved is to create personas for himself, to give himself moments in time where he can be respected and loved by other people. Um, so he's a fantasist and in that respect he's been successful. But as a con man, he's a bit of a disaster. In October 2003, Paul Bint pleaded guilty to charges including theft and attaining properties by deception. The judge said to Bint, you have caused anguish, embarrassment, loss, and difficulty to your victims. The judge also said a psychiatric report had concluded that Bint suffered from a currently untreatable psychopathic disorder, and so his case would not be dealt with under the Mental Health Act. Paul Bint was sentenced to four years and four months in prison. Paul Bint has obviously created something like 25 different aliases, different personas of his own personality, um, and it is you have to wonder whether he still knows who Paul Bint and whether Paul Bint exists today or is still that little boy in the hospital bed having his appendix out. Paul Bint's con man career creates a fascinating case file, not simply because of the audacity and perseverance he has exhibited, but because of the way he seems to thrive on his notoriety. Unlike other con men who, by definition, attempt to live anonymously, Bint has courted the press and even been interviewed by glossy magazines. I'm sure Paul Bint does enjoy people writing about him and the attention that he gets from being a con artist. People tend to view con artists as chancers, as rogues, rather than actually the criminals that they are. And so this would probably be quite an attractive identity for a man who has a very fragile sense of himself. In the kind of the, the colourful annals of of British criminal history, he certainly stands out. He was dubbed by the police at one time King Cobb, and because the tabloids have written about him as Britain's cruelest con man. Paul Bint has committed over 100 offences, appeared in court over 20 times, and spent almost a decade of his 25-year con man career in custody. Now released, there are fears Paul Bint will never stop. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Paul Bint re-offended on release. The way that he's unable to go straight, if you like, for even a day is quite telling, but con artists often find it hard to go straight because they're just not used to doing anything else. What could Paul Bint have done for a real job? Would he have been equipped for a normal life? He probably felt not. I personally don't think he, he will have learnt anything. I don't think he'll even have learnt from his mistakes. I think he'll do it again, and I think he'll be caught again. As much as you might think he's the lovable rogue, as much as there's been some humorous things written about him, about him being this Walter Mitty character, there's a very dangerous and sinister side to him. And the safest place for Paul Bint, quite frankly, is in jail. <laughs>